Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Top TV. So pop the kettle on, this is the Royal Tea. I'm Afia Hagen. The King returned to London for cancer treatment this week and is said to be in good spirits as he carries out face-to-face -face meetings. Plus, Harry and Meghan rebrand, but not without controversy. Joining me today to discuss all of that and much, much more are Royally Us podcast host Christine Ross, royal author and editor-in-chief of Majesty magazine Ingrid Seward, and The Sun's royal photographer Arthur Edwards. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Now, King Charles returned to London this week for more cancer treatment after his first public appearance at Sandringham. The 75-year-old monarch landed at Clarendon House in the Royal Helicopter after spending a week in Norfolk, resting following the shock announcement. He was pictured with his wife, Queen Camilla, by his side as the royal couple were driven to nearby Clarence House. Now, Arthur, the King is ploughing on with business and face-to-face -face meetings, isn't he? He is indeed, and he's um, very upbeat as well, looking very, you know, ready for work. And um, working with um, the Queen, Camilla, yesterday, she doesn't look like a concerned wife. She's just throwing everything into it, happy, laughing, joking. Uh, so, you know, I think by the sign, seeing the King last weekend, smiling, waving to the crowds, I just... Uh, you know, when you get cancer, it's nothing else seems to matter. But mm. if when the oncologist tells you that he can help you and, and get you better, um, which is probably what I think is happening there, uh, you know, you, you put on a, a brave face and that's what they're doing. And, and, and certainly, you know, it's a shock. It was a shock not to him, but to all of us, because, uh, you know, he's a very fit man. He's always kept himself in good shape, always, you know, careful what he eats, exercise played polo up until a few years ago and he's a you know and so it was a shock but you know um cancer it, it doesn't discriminate you know mm. it's uh, and um and he's and he's just as i say he stopped face to face going out and meeting the people because all they'll be doing is saying mostly oh i hope you get better and you know and and he's and he doesn't want that fuss he's meeting meeting these you know privy councillors and the prime minister and and uh, doing it all from Sandringham, which he prefers now to Highgrove. He's there all the time. Mm. So it's, um, it's not brilliant news, but I think, I think it's going to be all right. That's my view. I mean, mm. I don't have any medical knowledge of that, but just seeing the way they're behaving. Um, having had cancer in my own family, I know that you, it is a terrible shock and you don't really want it. You know, you're not feeling like laughing and joking and waving to people. But Camilla yesterday and last week as well, I was with her last week and just in such an upbeat, happy mood. So they're, they're giving that feeling that, you know, everything's all right in the, in the camp. Christine, Arthur said there, we saw Queen Camilla out last week, out this week, out last night as well. She's taking centre stage right now, isn't she? I think she is definitely trying to, um, you know, hold the spotlight as we have so many members of the royal family um, in the sick bed, so to, so to speak, um, with the king recuperating, really taking a huge step back. The Princess of Wales is still fully off of royal duties. And the Prince of Wales is, although he is stepping up his duties, he's still doing daddy duty. I know they're really trying to be there for school runs and rugby games and, and things like that for their children. So we are seeing a lot more of Queen Camilla. We're certainly seeing much more of Princess Anne. She's really boots on the ground, flying the flag for the for the British monarchy and, and doing the those... Um, all important events. And we know Camilla's, it's so important to her right now. We heard that when her helicopter was grounded last week, she decided to take a four hour car journey so that she didn't disappoint, cause another canceled royal engagement. So mm. it's so important to her that she is um, getting out there, uh, meeting with people, because lots of people have been disappointed by these canceled royal engagements. Even though it's it's a health issue, it's still really disappointing for the people, for the organizations that the members of the royal family would be meeting with. Mm -hmm. So I think it, we've seen it's so important to Queen Camilla to continue with that work and to really shine as much of a spotlight as she can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ingrid, you've written a book about King Charles and his relationship with his mum, which we're going to come to later on in the show. But what did you make of his decision to go public uh, with his cancer diagnosis? 
Well, King Charles is a very private person, and I think it was incredibly brave. And I think I think we all thought this is great. This is the monarchy being more visible, not so secretive about everything. And apparently, the king was delighted with with the reaction because a lot of people went to get their prostate checked. Um, so it, it really is a way forward. And I think. Hopefully that when he gets the all clear, if he does on his cancer, which you know we, we really hope he does, that he will then talk about it. I think he'll talk. He'll probably talk about the treatment, and he probably might even discuss what kind of cancer he's had because mm. again, it will help people. And I think this is very much the way forward. So Charles's monarchy is different from from his mother's, and it's more open. And he is he's now in charge of his own destiny. Mm. And he seems so much more relaxed. And I've, of course, a lot of that has to do with the wonderful relationship he has with Camilla. And they laugh and they have fun. And, you know, Clarence House is a happy place. It's chaotic. They're exhausted mm -hmm. because they're both, you know, they're both elderly, if you like. But they are having, uh, they're enjoying what they're doing and they really uh, feel very positive about helping. So I, I feel upbeat about it. Mm. You've written about Charles as a, as a child. Um, did he have health issues often? Was it when he was younger, was he unwell often? He, he was a very sickly, well, not a very, he was a sickly child. Mm. He had a lot of, um, he had sinusitis and he had a, a lot of problems with that. And, um, and he couldn't be with it. Once his Princess Elizabeth had become queen, so Charles was four, if he got ill, he couldn't be near his mum. Mm. Because, uh, so he, he's become very stoic about illness. All the royal family, or if they have a cold, they're all separate. Uh, and I think that those early years when Charles was sort of sent away, but I mean, obviously he was with his nannies, but he wasn't with his mum. And when kids are ill, they want their mummy. Yeah. And he couldn't have his mummy. So he's developed this very stoic attitude to illness. Mm. Well, of course, we wish him better. The relationship between the late Queen and her son, King Charles, has long been a fascination, and it's precisely the subject of Ingrid's new book, My Mother and I. Now, Ingrid, what was it about this relationship that intrigued you so much and inspired this book? Well, I love the, uh, I think mothers and sons uh, have a very special, special bond. Um, but of course, they're not always close. And here was this, this young woman, I mean, the Queen, had Charles in 1948, and she was born in 1926. I'm really bad on ages, so um, she would have been 20? 20, 20, 20 when she had, very young, she'd only been married a year, mm. but she she really wanted a baby. And then, so the, then this gorgeous baby appears, and you see the photograph of the Queen and Prince Philip and with their children. And, but Charles was very, actually very like the Queen. He was a very shy little boy. Whereas his sister was boisterous and she would run into a room and Charles would literally be holding onto Nanny's leg. <laughs> you know, you read about people holding onto their skirts, but he would literally hold Nanny's leg. And I think the Queen wanted him to be a braver. Uh, and, and he was very reticent. And and, and our Prince Philip really wanted Charles to be braver. And he used to do things like when he, when Charles needed to learn to swim, he'd throw him in the Buckingham Palace swimming pool. And I think Nanny Lightbody, who was his nanny at the time, was outraged. Mm. They eventually fell out, which is why she left. But I, I'm intrigued by how these kids are brought up in this rarefied world. And remember, this was the 50s. And it was really different. Aristocratic parents they didn't really see much of their children. They saw them in the morning um, when Nanny brought them down, and then they saw them in the evening, and they'd be all dressed in their sort of, you know, smartest clothes. But the Queen did visit the nursery, and she did, at least she sat on a little chair with a footman and bathed Charles. And mm. so they did have that interaction, but it was very much taken away from her. And I think later in her life, she really. She used to worry her that she just hadn't been there for him. Mm. Arthur, you spent many years photographing the late Queen and Prince Charles as he was then. What do you make of their relationship? Oh, I thought it was brilliant. You know, I mean, um, 
I always remember once he saying to somebody, I never say when I'm going to be king, because that's the day my mother dies. And I thought that was a lovely thing to say, you know, that he obviously was concerned about that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I thought they were, they were very good. They're always laughing together. I used to every year go to the um, Braemar Games at, at Balmoral and they'd be sitting next to each other and they'd be laughing and, and joking and, uh, and very close. And of course, you must remember on both, uh, seriously, the Golden and the Diamond Jubilee, when he introduced the, uh, my mummy, he said, called her mummy, mummy, and I thought that was so lovely. And he said lovely things about, you know, and of course, you know, mothers and sons are very close, you know, mm -hmm. and, and this, is, this is, and also with Andrew, she was very close with Andrew and, and Edward. And Anne, of course, and, and as Ingrid says, you know, Anne was very much like the Duke of Edinburgh, you know, just say it as it comes. And, and Charles was much more like Dianke's mother. But mm. I've I, I really enjoyed photographing him and, and, and her and, and the late Queen, you know, and, and certainly, you know, watching them together at the races, at the Derby. And, and as I say, you know, on the balcony, even the balcony of Buckingham Palace, having their quiet laughs together and, in, and the way they whisper to each other. I just think it's lovely, yeah. Mm. Christine, I want to get the American perspective from you. How are, um, how are Americans perceiving King Charles's reign so far? And also, how have they received, you know, this news of his cancer diagnosis? I, yeah, it's been so interesting to see the reaction because I think Americans immediately went to worst case scenario with, with a cancer diagnosis. What does this mean? Will we have another coronation soon? And of course, here in the UK, we were very, the palace was very keen to assure us that the prognosis is good, the king is very optimistic, and he's right now feeling quite well. Whereas in America, they were already <laughs> sort of getting out the black dresses mm. and, and preparing for another really, really sad occasion. And I think that um, it's made them look at the monarchy in a slightly different way, where mm -hmm. for a long time we have really been focused on Harry and Meghan, who we'll speak more about in a little bit, and William and Catherine, who are so popular in the US, mm. that now that we were sort of faced with, um, you know, really terrible news from, from King Charles, and what does this mean, and, and who, how, what does he mean to us? I think a lot of Americans are really impressed with King Charles's work with climate change, because for some reason in America, that's a, that's a contentious topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and King Charles really pushing that agenda forward, that's really his, we, we've heard that in many ways, that's his life's work. I yeah. think a lot of people in America respect that. Mm, definitely. Um, Ingrid, with the King's health diagnosis, we have been talking a lot about abdication, regency. Do you think we could see that for health reasons? The only reason would be for health reasons because abdication, as everybody probably knows that's interested in the royal family, is a really dirty word mm. within the British royal family um, because of uh, in the Duke of Windsor abdicating and, and leaving, you know, potential disaster. And um, so I don't think I think Prince William could be made regent only if his father was incapable of doing the job of kingship himself. But I think that's hopefully very unlikely. Um, so, so I mean, obviously people talk about it mm. when, when you know, because the, you know, because of the king's diagnosis, people are really talking about it. But I don't think for a moment it will happen. But it, it could happen. Now, Prince Harry and Meghan have had an online overhaul, launching a newly branded Sussex.com website. The couple replaced their Archwell webpage with a site called Sussex.com that includes their biographies and lists their recent activities. Now, did the couple risk a fresh row with the royal family by using their titles? Christine. You know, they talk about themselves as Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. They use their titles, Duke and Duchess of Sussex. They don't use HRH anywhere on the website. Why is it causing so much controversy? Well, I think because it is very, um, you cannot separate their titles, their use of the word Sussex from their relationship with the royal family, from their history with the royal family. They are the Duke and Duchess of Sussex because that's a title bestowed upon them by the, the monarch at the time. And it's, it's just, you can't break that connection. Um, 
I think that we are, I think there's a lot of issues at play here, a lot of things at play. This is a very, very purposeful choice, uh, but people are definitely reading a lot into it. Are they trying to rebrand themselves as more royal? Are they cashing in on the royal family? There's a lot of, a lot of thought is going into these, um, these controversies. Mm. Ingrid, what did you make of the rebrand? Well, it's very slick, it's very American, but it's very Harry and Meghan. How many times have they rebranded themselves? It just seems like it's you know, every other year, you know, every year they've got a rebrand. Mm -hmm. So I'm, a bit, I'm very skeptical about it. I just think that, you know, why don't they just do something mm -hmm. rather than keep relaunching themselves? It's presumably because they, they're in Canada and they're promoting the new Invictus Games that will be coming up. Um, but basically they're, they're promoting themselves because they need to get work. Mm -hmm. Arthur, what did you make of Sussex.com? Have you had a I look? Think it's a, I think it's a through? better name than Archwell, anyway. I think it's a nicer name. I mean, he's, but you know, they are the Duke and Duchess of Sussex after all, and uh, and until the king takes that title away from them, they're they're entitled to use it. But um, you know, they've they're not very popular, certainly not here, and I think they've been found out a bit in America as well. Some of the talk shows are being a bit unkind to them, but I think um, you know they're like Ingrid says, you know they. They need to make money, and now the, and they've just signed a new um, spot. Um, spot um, oh, pod, 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 podcast or something? Podcast podcast podcast. Yeah. They yeah. just signed a new <laughs> podcast deal after you know they were dumped by Spotify. So you know they're they're looking to make, uh, and of course their son Archie, who um, I think Archwell was named after, is now Prince. Archie mm -hmm. and, uh, and Princess Lilibet and Princess as well. Lilibet. So you know they've moved up a bit in the world. So, um, but um, you know this is a couple that, as you know, they've made their decision to break away from the royal family, and they, you know, Meghan is you know determined to uh, keep it that way and make money. She doesn't come here anymore. I notice when Harry comes, he always comes alone now, uh, and um, I think you know, you know, well. You know, I love Harry, so I, I can't really be bad -mouth him because, you know, I worked with him for many, many years and I loved working with him. He was such a joy to work with. He was so much fun and he was so much, you know, he so enjoyed it, the job as well. But, um, you know, he's become very sullen. Every time you see him, he's either walking in and out of a court suing the newspaper or suing somebody or other, or he's just here in a hurry, stays five minutes and goes again. Uh, he's just a changed person. and. And good luck to them, but you know, let them stay in America as far as I'm concerned. And unless they change their attitude towards the, their family, um, they need to stay there. Well, they've been spotted on the ski slopes of British Columbia, and Megan praised the attention to detail and creativity and care of their designers of their new website. After critics pointed out, the couple were told to drop the use of HRH when they quit as working royals. Now, this statement didn't address the question of the use of royal titles, did it, Christine? So does that in some way fuel the fire? Uh, I think it... It definitely does fuel the fire um, in the online conversation. Certainly all of the detractors will have latched onto that and, and really are going to use it to fuel their fire. But I think this may just be an issue of a, a copywriter who didn't actually know and uh, several people on the Sussex team who should have caught this issue a lot sooner. Mm. So while I, I struggle to believe that it was a very pointed decision, it does really um, lend to the conversation of this rebrand being, you know, connecting them further to the royal family. A lot of people are wondering if, now that they've found out that separating themselves from the royal family has actually hurt their image, mm. are they trying to sort of tangentially connect themselves back to the royal family in a, in a way that works for them? Mm. New podcast deal, as Arthur and Ingrid mentioned. Christine, talk us through that. What can we expect? This is very interesting. Um, Megan, the, the Duchess of Sussex, has signed with Lemonada, uh, who produces several celebrity viral podcasts um, lots of names that we would have heard before, like Jeanette McCurdy. And this is a really interesting step forward. We've heard that Archetypes is going to come back, mm -hmm. whether that's re-releasing old episodes or new ones. And it, Megan has hinted at other shows to come up in the future as well. So I think this may be a better relationship. This is a smaller firm that works really personally with their, with their um, podcast personalities. And so hopefully this lends to more work out of Archwell Audio and sort of on a better platform, a better, a better streaming service. Mm. Now, Ingrid, we were saying, you know, 
that we want them to get on and do things. And Megan is getting on and doing this podcast, more episodes of Archetypes. Do you think this will take them in a good direction? I, I really don't. I think that people, as Arthur was saying, you know, people loved Harry. And we've seen Harry change. Visually, anyway. Oh, terrible! Yeah. And so I think people are blaming Meghan. It's a bit like when you know you won't remember because you're all too young. But when Paul McCartney got married, and yeah. everyone hated Linda McCartney because they were taking away this, you know, this sort of icon. And Harry was very popular, and he always played to the camera. He was he was lovely, and Meghan's taken him away from us. I just don't think whatever they do in this country is going to make any difference. They, they are basically, people don't like them and they don't want to like them. It's aimed at her, but they blame her for making him this sort of rather gloomy looking person. Arthur, they're in British Columbia to kick off Invictus yeah. Games. It's one year to go uh, until the winter Invictus Games, which takes place 2025. Um, Invictus is still doing some incredible work. Should we perhaps focus on that? It is indeed. Um... You know, I went to the first, well, the first one in, in uh, Colorado Springs uh, and with Harry and he was, he was just unbelievable, you know, fantastic with the, with the injured troops. Um, and, it's, it is a, and it's one of the greatest achievements. But the only problem with Whistler is, you know, it's very expensive to get there. And, you know, some of the people that um, take part in those games are having trouble finding, you know, finding the money to get there. It's going to be a, a long haul for them, it's, you know, and, uh, and, and I was at Whistler with Harry many years ago when he went skiing there with his brother, and uh, and it's a, and it's a, a wonderful place. And 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 you know I hope they do manage to get there because they'll enjoy it. And you know he's as I say he's made a great difference to their to their lives. You know they aspire to compete in there now. It's changed. You know men with you know missing many limbs, three limbs, some are taking part in these games, and they and they're, and it gives them a an inspiration to to get there and achieve it. So. I just hope they can do it and get there. Mm. But, you know, Harry is, uh, he, he cares about these people. He was a soldier himself. He, he fought in, in, in the Afghan war and, uh, and, and, he, and he did it with credit, great credit. And so, you know, he sympathized with them. And, you know, when he flew back after it was revealed he was there, he was with injured soldiers on the plane, badly injured soldiers on the plane. And, uh, and, you know, obviously that had a serious effect on him and, and he's done amazing things with them. And some of the achievements these these injured soldiers have made is, is phenomenal. So good luck on you, Harry. You know, it's a good thing and don't stop it. But uh, try and get it <laughs> nearer the troops mm -hmm. next time, yeah. Prince Harry is said to have not wanted to be in the same room as the Queen when speaking to his cancer-stricken father, King Charles. That's according to Camilla's friend and journalist, Petronella Wyatt. Harry's relations with everyone apart from the King seem to be non-existent now. Ingrid, what do you think? Well, I think people I mean, are very hurt by what Harry wrote in his autobiography, Spare. I mean, Camilla has uh, every right to be more hurt than anyone. He, he, he was very unpleasant, accusing her of things which she hadn't done at all. But she's such a polite woman. She's such a nice, really, she is a lady. She, I don't think she would ever let on to Harry that she was annoyed or upset with him. Harry is probably petulant enough to let her know that he's upset with her. I don't know. We, we don't know. We weren't there. But I, I do find it very hard to imagine that he would... Well, he probably said, I really would like... Pa, I'd like a really private conversation with you. I mean, that's fair enough, mm. isn't it? It mm. is really fair enough. Christine, do you think relationships can be warmed up within the royal family? Perhaps this could be a watershed moment? What do you think? I think time can heal a lot of wounds. And I think especially when you're faced with, with the life-changing diagnoses, you know, hugely emotional issues like this, King Charles is Prince Harry's only living parent, and that makes a difference in, in the relationship, in, in how they may move forward. And so while I, I'm not sure we're going to see any great changes, certainly not in, in for the public to see anyways, I do hope that there's a little bit of bridge building happening behind the scenes. Mm. Arthur, what do you think? Do you think relations are defrosting? Well, it's, it's not only bad, uh, it's bad with William as well. I mean, he trashed William in his book as well. But... Um, 
like Ingrid said, you know, Camilla is a, is, is a kind lady. I remember once talking about Harry. She's always a lovely boy. He's a lovely boy, she said. And, uh, and she thinks of him like that. But um, he's got he's to change his tune. He's got to bring his children over to meet the king, see the king, see, meet, meet their, their cousins. And, you know, and, and that's, that's when I think that things will change, when he starts to do things like that, not just turn up quickly for a 20-minute, half an hour chat with his father and then go home. Not even attempting to go and see his brother, not attempting to spend time with with him, and and because he's you know his wife was recovering from this serious operation, you know maybe go and see them, but no, he's um, the schism is just widening, and it's just becoming worse with Harry and and William, and uh, and the king probably is fed up with Harry, and he's bleating and moaning and 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 trashing the royal family. You can't keep doing that. But he's got to change a big way for it to get better. You know, he can't just think it, he's going to make it overnight. He's got to do a lot of penance. And I think bringing the children over and introducing them to their cousins would be a, one of the first things to be really lovely. Mm. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. My huge thanks to Christine, Arthur and Ingrid. If you want to join in with the debate, please leave a comment and make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss a single episode. We will be back next week with all the latest on the royal family. Hope you can join us. See you then.